Okay, let's get started. So in the second part of the lecture, we're going to talk about memory ordering. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an important topic for correctness. It's an important topic for correctness of any kind of program, actually. Ordering of operations in general, that's the more general, uh, fundamental uh, part, right? But in particular, memory ordering becomes problematic if you have a shared memory multiprocessor. Uh, and we're talking about tightly coupled shared memory multiprocessors. Uh, it's also called memory consistency uh, for uh, reasons that will become clear uh, soon. Uh, essentially, it's what we're going to talk about. And these are some readings. There's actually very interesting readings here. Uh, some of them are hard to understand. Uh, but this is something that I will assign. I would require you to read. It's only two pages, as I said. It's, it's the paper that introduced sequential consistency, which you will learn about. How many people know about sequential consistency here? OK, some people. Where did you learn this? OK, this semester. That's good. How about you? Distributed system. Yeah, exactly. Distributed system. If you've taken a distributed systems course, you should have talked about consistency, uh, like ordering of events in general. Uh, and it's important to satisfy the happened before intuition, for example, in distributed systems. And sequential consistency is all about happened before. And we will see that. But I would recommend that you read it. Lamp Leslie Lamport's a Turing Award winner, uh, if you don't know. These are actually very good papers, also, these two especially. Uh, they're the early papers that talk about more relaxed consistency models. So it turns out sequential consistency is very strong. You don't really need that strong consistency for correctness. Uh, you can relax things a bit at the expense of more effort on the program and the software stack. So this, is, this, uh, this particular topic is another example of the programmer microarchitect or architect trade-off. You can mic make life really hard for the architect, really easy for the programmer, and vice versa. And the hope is that you will get somewhere in between that where everybody's happy or not unhappy. Right? OK. So uh, before I start this, uh, people confuse these things a lot, actually. Uh, memory consistency versus cache coherence. These are completely different things. We're going to cover cache coherence in the next lecture. Uh, but consistency is about the uh, ordering of all memory operations from different processors uh, to different memory locations. It's really about. You look at all of the memory operations that are done by all of the processors, what kind of ordering do the different processors observe? Are, and is the ordering consistent? Is the ordering that processor A observes of all memory operations from all processors consistent with the ordering processor B observes uh, from, uh, for, for all, pro uh, all operations from all processors? That's the idea. It's about all operations from all processors and what each processor observes in that ordering. Hopefully, you will get the same ordering, right? But we will see that sequential consistency dictates that all processors need to see the same ordering. And if you do that, it's easier to program a system. If you don't do that, you can actually get incorrect programs, basically. Or incorrectly executing programs, I should say. The program may be completely correct, but the result that you get may be incorrect because the hardware didn't really satisfy some ordering requirements, like sequential consistency. So this is really about all uh, memory locations from all processes. Whereas uh, basically it's also called global ordering of access to all memory locations. Whereas coherence is really about the ordering of operations from different processes to the same memory location. And in particularly uh, write to read or update based ordering. So if you don't have any updates, you don't have any problem with coherence, basically. Uh, for, but this is really about a single memory location also. So if you have this memory location cached in multiple caches, how do you keep the value uh, coherent across these different caches? Such that whenever this processor updates memory location x, the other processor don't, doesn't get a stale value for memory location x because it cached it earlier. Right? That's the idea. So it's really about the local ordering of accesses to each cache block. I mean, it doesn't really actually need to be cache block. It's really about a memory address to be finer grain than a cache block. Does that make sense? So keep this in mind. This is really about a single memory location and how different processors observe updates to those memory locations and how do you keep it co coherent. Whereas this is really about all memory operations of all processors. And we will see why this is important. This may not be intuitive initially, but we will see that this is really important also. So in the end, as I said earlier, uh, these are example difficulties of multiprocessing. Uh, then we're talking about this part, really, at this point. Uh, you, you want 
a good memory consistency mechanism uh, that the programmer relies on and assumes from the hardware and you want a good cache coherence mechanism that the programmer relies on and assumes and they don't need to think about uh, some basics, basics that are satisfied by the hardware. In the end, these are uh, about really uh, making programmers job easier and writing correct programs. We're not even talking about high performance at this point because these are some basics that you need to ensure that the programmer writes correct programs easily. I guess high performance, cache coherence is really about high performance because I mean, you, you need to support uh, the cache coherence somehow. If you have the programmer, a problem on the programmer, they could support it. Yes, but they may not actually get uh, high performance pro programs. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so hopefully you'll learn both of these. Have, have, have people learned about cache coherence? Okay, probably in the same course. In the distributed systems course, maybe. In the distri uh, distributed systems normally doesn't assume that uh, this issue basically. The cache coherence is not a concern in many distributed systems because most of them are really based on this loosely coupled processing that we discussed, right? Because you don't have a global shared memory. But I mean some distributed systems of course actually go into cache coherence. Uh, but maybe not yours. <laughs> okay, basically we're talking about operations, right? In the end, uh, we're really talking about op ordering of operations and in particular memory operations over here. Uh, and the key question is, in what order should the hardware execute these operations and report the results of these operations. Because these orders may be different. The hardware may have some execution, but <laughs> in the end it may report different results, a different order to the software. Right? Existing out of order execution machines do that, right? They execute operations completely out of the program order internally, but when they finish retire operations, when the operations are actually really updating the architectural state, they do it in program order. So they fetch instructions in the single program, single thread order that's specified by the programmer, instruction by instruction in the von Neumann model, and then they execute internally out of order, and then they basically reorder the operation such that the updates of the architectural state, memory and register file that's exposed to the programmer, is done in the program order that was specified by the programmer. So that's the reporting results part over here. And in the end, this is really, this ordering of operations is really a contract between the programmer and the microarchitect. Or it, it, as specified by the ICE. It's a, it's a contract between the hardware and the software. The soft, uh, this piece of paper, or this booklet, that's called the instructions that architecture says, this is the ordering of operations that the programmer can assume and that the hardware promises to provide. And depending on where you, like how you define that ordering, programmer's life may be easy or hard. Uh, okay. in, in general, preserving an expected or more accurately ag agreed upon order simplifies the programmer's life, uh, as we said. And, and this is very clear in out-of-order execution processors, right? In fact, out-of-order execution, when it was first invented uh, in 1960s, uh, uh, IBM, for example, had the IBM 3691, which was executing floating point operations out of the program, out of the uh, program order that was specified by the programmer. And the machine was finishing those instructions in the order that was not specified in an order that was not specified by the program. Basically, it was doing out of order finishing of instructions. And people who designed this machine had to get really special permission from IBM to really sell these machines because that, it was really breaking the contract between the hardware and the software. And as a result, these machines were not that successful. <laughs> Basically. Programmers had difficulty programming them because underlying hardware was not really obeying the expected sequential order of a program. And what would you do, right? You don't care about a high performance program if you cannot debug it or if it's wrong uh, from your perspective, of course, because it's not satisfying the, your order. So that was actually a very leading machine, but in the end, it was not successful. And auto order machines became successful only when, in the 1980s, uh, people figured out that, oh, you should really reorder the operations inside the hardware and report them back in the order that the programmer expects. So now you're satisfied. Even though you break the rule internally, uh, even though you break the contract internally, what you expose the programmer is really what you promised. Okay, so this leads to a lot of benefits, of course. It enables you to debug easily, clearly. It enables easy state recovery, easy exception handling, because now uh, you, you can rely on a precise state in a program, right, basically. Whenever you're, uh, you, you, you can easily say, uh, uh, based on the retired stream of instructions, this is the point in the program that I originally wrote 
uh, where the machine is. Right. Internally, it may be executing other stuff, but it's not exposing that to me. I know that the machine has definitely finished this instruction. It has not reported me anything else after that. That eases debugging clearly. That eases the state recovery because you can always go back to that point easily and exception handling. And we covered this already in digital circuits. I'm not going to go uh, through this. If you're really interested, you can read that, look at that lecture. But of course, this is again a trade off. Preserving an expected order usually makes the hardware designer's life difficult. And clearly, in out of order execution process, you need to add extra machinery, hardware, to keep track of which instruction is executing, which instruction is the oldest. Uh, and you need to have a, a construct called reorder buffer to do the reordering. That's one way of doing it, actually. Essentially, you need to add additional hardware to preserve the order. Yeah, uh, especially if the goal is to design a high performance processor. Actually, uh, in, in, uh, out of order processors actually need to do the memory ordering as well, right? Because uh, you're executing a lot of instructions. Let's say you're, uh, you, can, you can execute uh, 512 instructions inside your instruction window. Some of them are loads and stores. And you need to ensure that uh, uh, the, the loads and stores that you execute satisfy the order that's specified by the program. You should not get wrong results. First of all, you should satisfy all the dependencies. But also you should satisfy, you should report the results of stores in the order that's specified by the program. Okay. Also the loads. And for this, you need load store queues. And again, if you're interested, you can go back to the digital design lectures. And there's a lot of complexity in these load store queues. Because now you want to execute a store operation. Uh, how do you know that you can execute it? Right. Oh, actually, you want to execute a load operation. That's, uh, that's more intuitive. You want to execute a load operation. And there are a bunch of stores that are earlier in the program order whose addresses you have not calculated yet. Even if there's only one, you have a problem. Because how do you know that this load instruction should execute? Yeah. Because you don't know the address of a previous store. You may know the address of this load. But that previous store may actually write to that same location that this uh, load is trying to load from. So you need to clearly design hardware data structures to ensure that correct operation happens. And that's not easy. OK. OK, so that's about uh, memory or ordering of operations in general. Now let's take a look at ordering of operations in a single processor, uh, and specifically memory operations in this case. In a single processor, uh, as, as we discussed earlier, one Neumann model, one of the key principles is really sequential instruction processing. Right? You execute each instruction sequentially. So the abstraction that's provided to the programmer, and what the programmer expects is you execute the instruction, and no instruction after that has started, and uh, every instruction before this is finished. That's the sequential processing. And you go through instructions in a, in a sequential manner. So that's what you would expect. Right? That's the von Neumann model. Uh, meaning hardware executes the load and store operations, just like any other operation, in the order specified by the sequential program. So clearly, this is good. Uh, but of course, this is low performance. If the hardware is really designed to do that. Auto order execution makes it high performance, but it doesn't change the semantics. The semantics as expected by the programmer is still the same. Uh, and hardware retires or reports to the software the results of loaded store operations in the order specified by the sequential program. So it's exactly what the programmer expects, even though underneath you're doing something completely crazy. Let's say, right? Which is actually good. I think looking at the design of those high performance processors underneath is really amazing. Okay, especially, I mean, high performance is not the only goal. You want to do it very efficiently also, right? Okay, so clearly uh, there are advantages to this. Uh, architectural state is precise within an execution, meaning that when you're running the program, uh, architectural state is precise, so you get what you expect. Uh, and you can also recover from exceptions, uh, because you can also recover, you can always, whenever you get an exception, for example, you can always recover to the uh, last instruction that you retire. Right? And architectural state is also consistent across different runs of the program. Uh, because uh, this is actually important, right? Whenever you have a single threaded program, you get a bug. You want to run the program and you want to replicate the bug, ideally, right? so that you can solve the problem that you have in your software. That's really important for debugging. And th it's easier to debug these programs as a result. Whereas multi threaded execution is not like that. And we're not going to solve this problem, actually. We're not going to solve the second problem, unfortunately, in, in this, in this uh, lecture. There are other potential solutions, but it's not going to be, we're not going to keep the architectural state consistent across different runs of the program. Because it's not an easy thing to do, actually, if you have a multi-threaded program. Okay, 
of course, as we discussed, this advantage of this preserving of this order is uh, overhead. Uh, it also reduces performance. It increases complexity. There is a scalability because you need to add all of this hardware to preserve the order. Make sense? Okay, so that's single processor. Now let's take a look at another example. It's a data flow processor. We covered this briefly, but in the, in the digital design lecture, we covered it a lot more, actually. So what is a data flow processor? Essentially, data flow processor gets rid of the sequential execution completely. It's data-driven processing. Uh, an instruction executes when all of its operands are ready, when all of its data is ready. And there's a processor that understands what data, which data is ready, and an instruction uh, becomes ready to execute when both of its operands are ready, assuming it has two operands, and it fires, and it creates uh, uh, basically, it enables the readiness of some other instruction, right? Because some other instruction is waiting for the output of this instruction. Basically, everything executes in a data driven manner in this case. That's why it's called data flow processing. Uh, and if you think about this, there is no program counter, there is no sequential execution. Now, the question is what is the ordering of operations in this thing? Basically, in this case, a memory operation executes when its operation op uh, uh, operands are ready. And in this case, ordering is really specified uh, by data dependencies. And also how long it takes to resolve the data dependencies. And true operations can be executed and retired in any order if they have no dependency. Now you can see that this is going to be not so easy to debug, right? Clearly, because uh, you may have, uh, yeah, exactly. You, you basically, you have no, uh, as a programmer, you have no ground to uh, base the execution on. There is no sequential order. You basically have this data flow graph that you launched on a, a processor, and the processor is executing it, and it could be executing the operations in any order, because you didn't specify any order, and the processor is just executing things in data flow order. So that's why data flow processors are actually very difficult to debug. Uh, but of course, there's an advantage. Now we have lots of parallelism. It's very high performance. Uh, actually, data flow processors traditionally had the too much parallelism problem. If you actually do a good job in your data flow, uh, graph, then you have a lot of parallelism. Imagine uh, all your system operating in data flow principles, right? Then the entire program, the entire system is a chain of programs that are connected with some <coughs> data inputs. Essentially, you can, you can view everything that happens as uh, nodes and arcs that are connecting the nodes. And a node is an operation, and that node fires when its arcs are ready or have inputs in them. And everything can be that way in a system. Not just a single program, but programs that communicate with each other, the operating system, the input and output. For example, when I press this button over here, a particular input goes to a data flow node. Right? It's not like when I press this button, there's something that's looping and waiting for pulling that register, which is really sequential in the end. Okay, so you get lots of parallelism and high performance clearly, but of course, the disadvantage in this case is precise state essentially doesn't exist because nobody specified that state. And because it doesn't exist, it's very hard to maintain. And as a result, it's very, very hard to debug. And this is one of the key problems in data flow in general. If you expose this sort of programming model to uh, the programmer, uh, then the programmer has very difficult time debugging uh, data flow machines. And also, uh, this is the first thing. Uh, even a single program, when you're running a single program, precise state doesn't exist. But again, order can change across the runs of the same program, clearly. right? Uh, and this is very hard to debug. But that was also the case uh, in a single processor. Uh, no, that, that was also the case in a multi-thread processor. We haven't talked about the multi-thread processor yet. That's going to be also the case in a multi-thread processor, but in, in a more limited way, perhaps. This is very hard to debug, basically, in the end. So data flow is kind of the extreme, basically. You have no order, right? and no order specified. And people have tried to put some ordering requirements on data flow. I don't think the efforts have been very successful in the end. So that's why data flow processors, at least in the way they were envisioned, in a general purpose way, have not been very successful. Right? Because they changed the programming model completely. It's great for parallelism, but it's not great for programming uh, ease. Uh, but they've been extremely successful when you don't expose it to the program. Essentially, all of the single processors that we were, we were talking about over here operate on data flow principles underneath. Okay. Now let's talk about uh, MIMD processors, or multiprocessors essentially, or multi-thread processors. Uh, uh, in this case, each processor's memory operations are in sequential order with respect to the thread running on that process. Basically, the thread runs. They're assuming that each processor obeys a one Neumann model. Each processor is sequential 
not data flow. Uh, each process is sequential, and each process memory operations are done in sequential order. And multiple processors execute memory operations concurrently. Now, uh, there are multiple questions over here. One is, how does the memory see the order uh, of operations from all processors? This is actually the question of memory ordering here. Because if this is the only thing that you specify, each processor operates in a sequential manner, von Neumann manner, uh, and there's nothing else you specify, basically there's no other constraint on the ordering. Uh, basically, in other words, what is the ordering of operations across different processors? That's what the memory ordering is about. And we will see that if you don't specify something else on top of this, basically saying that each processor finishes its operation in the order specified by the program running on that processor, then you will get incorrect results, potentially. Uh, so actually, why is this important? Let's talk about that first. Uh, uh, why, why does ordering even matter? Uh, I mean, we've kind of been talking about this, but let's make it uh, more concrete over here. We want the ease of debugging. Basically, it's nice to have the same execution done at different times to have the same order of execution. Basically, it's repeatable execution, right? Now, we're not going to get this. <laughs> this is very hard to get uh, in a multi-thread program because threads get scheduled in different ways and one thread may execute before another. So that order across different runs is not going to be easy to get. We're going to talk about this one especially and this one. So this repeatability actually is very, very good to have, but it's not easy to have. Uh, I mean, you could, if, you, if you've done multi-thread programming, you've probably seen this in your own life. You run a multi-thread program once, and another time, you may actually get different order of execution across the thread. Uh, so debugging may be easy, uh, harder actually because you get different order of execution. Uh, and you may have a bug in one order of execution that's exercise, and when you run it again, the bug disappears because threads are executed in some completely different order. Now, they don't even contend for the shared data, potentially. Right? Usually bugs happen because of shared data synchronization. Right? Okay. So we're not going to talk about that. But we're going to talk about this, basically. The key question is, can we have an incorrect execution if the order of memory operations is different from the point of view of different processors? And the answer will be yes, basically. Uh, and the last one, uh, clearly this is not good, right? Because this is about even a single run. You, you actually get wrong results. It's not about debugging, it's about correctness. Uh, if you get a wrong result uh, without additional constraints on the ordering, then that's not good. And the last one is about performance and overhead. So to overcome this correctness problem, maybe you say, okay, everything goes in a very strict order. And that leads to issues. Issues meaning Hardware designer now is more constrained. They have to satisfy this order. And some of the performance enhancement techniques that relax the order may be difficult to really design. For example, it's, it's, if you're doing out-of-order execution, for example, it may not be actually easy to send the loads in an out-of-order manner outside your core because some other processor is going to observe them in a different order than you're observing them. Right? That's the idea over here. So cache is also do that, right? Caches, for example, if you have a cache, then your loads are happening inside the core, and the other processors are not even seeing those loads. Stores may also be happening there, right? The other processors may not be even seeing them. So these performance enhancing techniques usually reorder the operations or eliminate some of the operations from the perspective of the system. And as a result, uh, they, are, they go against strict ordering that we're going to first impose uh, to solve the correctness problem. That's why it's fascinating, basically. It's really about the performance correctness overhead complexity trade-off. You can get correctness by being very strict, but you will limit your performance optimization. Or, or you will lead to a lot of overhead in the end. OK, so basically we're going to talk about correctness. So when could order affect correctness uh, in, uh, if you have a multi-threaded program? And I think you know the answer over here. If the different threads are not touching each other, they will not affect each other's correctness. Right? Then they touch each other when they, op uh, they basically operate on shared data. Right? And shared data requires shared locks or shared synchronization primitives, essentially shared memory locations in the end. Right? When one is updating and the other is uh, reading, you really want to get uh, consistent uh, order over here as we will. Basically when you protect shared data. And we already know about protecting shared data. Uh, this is fundamental. Threads are not allowed to update shared data correct concurrently for correctness purposes, clearly. 
and access to shared data are encapsulated into critical sections and or protected via different synchronization constructs that we've seen, some of which we've seen, locks, semaphores, condition variables. And only one thread can execute a critical section uh, at a given time. Right? So that's the mutual exclusion principle. And we've seen examples of this earlier. Uh, and I will posit that if you really want to program <coughs> correctly in the presence of shared data updates, uh, the hardware, the multiprocessor should really provide the correct execution of synchronization primitives to enable the programmer to protect the shared data. Right? The programmer can now count on some basic primitive to construct a lock, for example. Right? If the hardware doesn't provide the basic primitive to do the ordering correctly, if you can potentially get wrong results, then you cannot even construct a lock. Right? And that's the idea. This memory ordering is so fundamental because you, you cannot even construct a lock if you don't get that ordering correct. Uh, so, okay, so any questions so far? Maybe I'm going too fast? Okay, maybe not. So I should speed up. Let's get it. Uh, basically, a uh, programmer needs to make sure mutual exclusion is correctly implemented. And when I talk about mutual exclusion, it's mutual exclusion, but the other synchronization primitives also uh, are similar. And we will assume this, basically. In this, this, what I'm going to talk about is not about programmer at all. We are, we are going to assume that the programmer has done the right thing, and they've correctly implemented mutual exclusion, which is also very interesting because they, not all programmers correctly implement mutual exclusion. And if you're really interested, uh, correct parallel programming is an important topic, clearly, at the software level. Uh, and this is a very seminal paper. How many of you have read this one? No courses that assign this one? How many of you have heard about Dijkstra? Okay, that's good. Dijkstra's algorithm, that's good. It's positive, I guess. <laughs> But if, if this is actually a fundamental paper that talks essentially about how to construct uh, essentially multi-thread programs, let's say. It's called cooperating sequential processes, but those are multi-thread programs. And how to construct them correctly. What you should do in the software to construct them correctly. It talks about basically how, how you would uh, design algorithms for mutual exclusion correctly. And there's also a Decker's algorithm that this paper talks about. You can read. But I would definitely recommend reading this. I'd recommend reading a lot of Dijkstra's papers, for sure. Uh, okay, anyway. Uh, but this, we're not going to talk about this, basically. We're going to assume that the programmer has done the right thing, everything is correct. At the software level, you ensure mutual exclusion. So one of the things, for example, clearly at the software level, uh, if you don't get the lock, you need to retry, right? How you do that retry becomes important. You shouldn't go into deadlocks. You shouldn't go into live locks in those retries. And that this is about that, partially about that. There's more into that, of course. Uh, so all of that needs to be handled. But uh, for all that to, uh, to work, programmer really needs to rely on hardware primitives to support correct synchronization. So if the par hardware primitives are not correct or unpredictable, meaning they sometimes work or sometimes don't work, programmer's life is very tough at that point. Right? You cannot construct a correct program. Or, I mean, this is the, of course the extreme perhaps, or if the hardware primitives are correct but not easy to reason about, then programmer's life is still tough. Because now that you have to reason about this complicated uh, synchronization ordering primitive uh, that requires them to basically label all of their data, for example, like what is, uh, what is a synchronization variable, what is not a synchronization variable, and they, that might be too much work. They may forget right, labeling something. So basically, you want hardware primitives that are simple and clearly that are correct. Uh, okay, so let me give you an example of uh, why the earlier uh, uh, assumption on memory ordering, the saying each processor obeys the sequential instruction order, is not enough in a multiprocessor. And we're going to look at the example of a very simple mutual exclusion uh, with my nice handwriting, I guess. <laughs> basically, hopefully it's easy to read still. Basically, we have two processors uh, that are going to access some shared data. Uh, and we're going to assume what's done in the program is correct. And this is actually a correct construct, assuming that you fill the else's in a nice way. But we don't care about that at this point. It doesn't matter. Assuming that this is correct, we're going to get an incorrect result. Uh, so what, this, what these two threads that are executing on these two processors are doing is they're going to access a critical section. And all of this code is there to protect the critical section. This is just for synchronization. We're not talking about any shared data updates. You can put anything you want into the critical section. And clearly, because it's a critical section, only P1 or P2 should be in this critical section at any given time, not both of them. Right. Let's see. Okay, not both is visible, I guess. Okay, so what, uh, we're going to assume very simple. This is a synchronization variable, right? F1 
says f1 equals uh, 1 means that the processor is in the critical section. And f2 equals 1 means that uh, processor 2 is in the critical section. Okay? And you can make this program work, assuming you put the right things in else. Mm. So, so this processor initially uh, sets f1 to 0. It's not in the critical section. Uh, and it does stuff. And at some point, it decides, OK, I want to go into the critical section. So it first sets f1 in, I mean, critical section variable to 1. And then it checks whether f2, the other processor, is in the critical section. Uh, and if it's, uh, is this correct? See, even I, even I, I get confused over here. <laughs> so yes, if, if f2 is equal to 0, meaning that the other processor is not in the critical section, then it enters the critical section. And then it does whatever it needs to do in the critical section. And when it's done, it sets f1 to 0, saying that I'm not in the critical section anymore. Make sense? So, the, and the, the other processor does the same thing, except f2 and f1 are swapped. Basically, it checks whether uh, processor 1 is in the critical section, right, over here. So basically, f2 is the variable that indicates processor 2 is in the critical section. When it's ready to take the critical section, it sets f2 to 1. And then it checks if processor 1 is in the critical section by checking f1. If f1 is 0, that means the processor is not in the critical section, hopefully. And then it enters the critical section. And at the end of the critical section, it sets f2 to 0. So you can make this work correctly, assuming you, this else is correct, right? Because if this fails at this point in time, you need to retry it somehow. And this else is going to do that. But clearly, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that else also to make it correct, deadlock-free and live-lock-free which is about the programmer effort up there. Make sense? Yes? Could you say it again? Oh, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that's a mistake. That, that dash is a mistake. So f1 is equal to zero. Yeah, I should correct that. We will correct that at the end of the lecture and have an f1 equal to zero. So we'll patch this. That's good. You're paying attention. <laughs> because there is no such operator like this, right? <laughs> I don't know what that means, actually. But this is an equal sign. You're setting f1 to 0. And this is the correct one. You're setting f2 to 0 over here. OK. So we're going to label some of these operations over here. This is a, b. a is setting the synchronization variable that I'm in the critical section, f1 to 1. And b is testing uh, whether the other processor is in the critical section. Uh, and similarly, x is executed on this processor. It's setting the f2 uh, to 1. And uh, y is testing f1, uh, uh, f1 over here. Okay. So let's assume that p1 is in the critical section over here. Intuitively, it must have executed a, right? Uh, which means that f1 must be 1, since a happens before b, based on the ordering that we have in a single processor, right? Which means that P2 should not enter the critical section. Right? That's the assumption. That's the assumption I make when I write this program clearly. Of course, the question is, can the two processors, I don't expect an answer because I already answered the question, but can the two processors be in the critical section at the same time, given that they both obey the von Neumann mod, and there's no other restriction on ordering? And the answer is yes, basically. Can anybody come up with an example? I'll come up with an example. But basically, I guess I'll give you some short time. There's a reason why I put this interconnection network here, because it makes the example easier. Basically, it's really about the ordering of operations and what the processors assume about the ordering of operations in the end. So the answer is yes. This is actually also in Dijkstra's. Uh, paper, so you should take a look at it. Uh, not that it's just a uh, Lamport's paper. Uh, but basically, this is about how you can get an incorrect result for one reason, due to an implementation that does not provide sequential consistency. So basically, you look at P1 and P2. They're executing. For some reason, whatever reason, uh, you have the different physical memories uh, that, w that house F2 and F1. And let's assume that uh, F2 is closer to P1 and F1 is closer to P2, whatever. Right? Uh, Let's look at the timeline of execution. Let's assume that time 0, P1 executes A. That was, uh, the operation A was setting F1 to 1, basically. Uh, and then it sends uh, A to memory. 
So this is the store to F1. Right? And from processor one's point of view, the store is complete at this point in time. And at the same time, processor 2 executes X. Let's assume that these are both doing the same thing at the same time, right? Uh, basically, we're we are essentially doing this at the same time, this at the same time, and we're sending stuff to memory while we're doing that. Uh, okay, let's go back over here. Okay, uh, okay A is sent to memory. Processor 2 executes X. Uh, X is really setting F2 to 1, saying that I'm in the critical section. And from processor 2's point of view, the store to F2 is complete. Make sense? It says, okay, I've stored to memory, I'm done. Now I can move to the next operation. Makes sense, right? Okay, that's time zero. Now uh, remember this picture. Uh, uh, time, uh, I think we, I already said this actually. Uh, this is uh, essentially the same thing that was on the previous slide. At time one, let's say, processor one executes B. And it, uh, this is really testing whether processor two is in the critical section, right? It's testing if F2 is equal to zero. Uh, and it sends B to memory. Basically, this is a load for F2, and this load is sent to memory. And then processor 2 does essentially the same thing, uh, but it's checking whether processor 1 is in, in the critical section. It's basically testing F1 is equal to 0. It's a load to F1. It's sending this load to memory also, this operation Y2. And we call that processor 2 is trying to uh, check if F1 is equal to 0, and processor 1 is trying to check F2 is equal to 0. And I've constructed this nicely so that processor 1 has very quick access to F2 and processor 2 has a, a very quick access to F1. Uh, so what happens? At time 50, uh, memory sends back to processor 1 F2. Basically, what, uh, it didn't uh, load to F2 gets completed, meaning this request for F2 gets completed because processor 1's request to F2 reached this memory very quickly. And at the same time also, the memory sends back to processor 2 F1. And load to F1 is complete. And it sends 0. Right. Why? Because this store that was done by this processor hasn't reached the memory yet. And this store that was done by this processor hasn't reached the memory yet. So even though both processors, from their perspective, they set F1 and F2 to 1, the memory was not updated before the other processors actually tested. That memory. Does that make sense? So this is a real example where this could happen. So as a result, this processor is happily assuming that no other processor, the other processor is not in the critical section because it got a zero value from memory. And this processor also assuming that the other processor is not in the critical section because it's got a zero value from memory for F1. And at and the end, both processors are in the critical section now. Now, at time 100, I just made this up, memory completes this A operation. Eventually, the store setting F1 to 1 reaches memory, and the memory completes it, but it's too late, right? Because the other processor already read it before that memory actually received that update. And to be, I guess, symmetric, memory does complete uh, the Y operation also. Now F2 becomes 1, but it's again, it's too late. So this is like clearly a cooked up example, but this kind of example can happen in real systems, especially if you don't have, uh, I mean here, how do you guarantee ordering even the interconnection network, right? Because you have no idea what, at what order should the operation be performed from different processors. So you cannot solve this problem by doing some ordering in the interconnection network. It's really, uh, you need to satisfy some sort of ordering. Basically, okay, before we go into the ordering, so what happened really? If you actually pull a step back, this is what happened from the processor one's point of view. Which memory operations get e got executed? In what order? So basically, processor one saw that A got executed, F1 is equal to 1, and then B got executed, it tested F2 and got a 0, and then X got executed, X is basically uh, uh, this one. Uh, Basically, F2 is equal to 1, right? Whereas processor 2's point of view, this is, this is where F2 actually finally got updated in the memory. Whereas if you look at processor 2's point of view, it completed X right away, right? It sent X to memory and assumed that it's complete. And then based on that, it moved on, and it, from its point of view, Y got executed, test of F1 equals 0. And then A got executed, 
only very late. And cluster one assumed that that happened early. So if you look at this, not a problem, right? From, from the von Neumann model, cluster one's operations are in sequential order, cluster two's operations are also in sequential order, it's not a problem. But both clusters saw inconsistent orders. And it's inconsistent badly in the sense that from cluster one's point of view, A appeared to happen before X, whereas cluster two has a conflicting view. From its perspective, X appeared to happen before A. Clearly, we, both of them cannot be correct at the same time, right? That's the fundamental principle of distributed systems, actually. You have to, you, both of them cannot be correct at the same time, and as a result, you have a problem over here. So basically, these clusters did not see the same order of operations to memory. That's the problem. Uh, and that's essentially it. Uh, and this resulted in the violation of the happened before relationship between multiple updates to memory. Uh, and uh, uh, this, uh, essentially, this, this view was inconsistent between the two processors' point of view. Uh, and as a result, each processor thought the other was not in the critical section. And that's clearly a violation of the mutual exclusion principle. Okay. Okay, so clearly the problem is there. And the problem is actually really with this shared data of things. If you're updating your own data, nobody's touching that data, nobody really cares in the end. That's why the solution is actually going to be very strong, uh, stronger than needed in the end. So how can we solve the problem? Basically, the idea is sequential consistency, and that was introduced by that Lamport paper in 1979. It's a very intuitive, clean idea. Uh, all processors need to same, uh, see the same order of operations to memory. And in this case, all operations. Basically, all, all, all memory operations, I should say. Nobody cares about your ad inside the cluster in this case, because you're not sharing the registers. If you share the registers, a similar problem will happen. Uh, but memory is shared, so all memory operations happen in an order called the global total order that is consistent across all processors. It's a global order because it's across all processors, and it's a total order because it's a total order. It's a strict total ordering across every single memory operation that you see from all processors. Okay. So the assumption is that within this global order, each processor's operations appear in sequential order with respect to its own operations. That's the one Neumann sequential uh, uh, processing principle in a single processor, clearly. So we still need to satisfy that, of course. And that's hopefully satisfied more easily than uh, this global order. OK, so if you read that paper, uh, the paper defines a multiprocessor system to be sequentially consistent under two conditions. If the result of any execution is the same as if the operations of all the processors were executed in some sequential order, so there could be multiple, sequ multiple sequential orders, clearly. Uh, and the operations of each individual processor appear in the sequence in the order specified by its program. That's the that's program, single program order, clearly. Okay, so this is a memory ordering model, or a memory model. Essentially, this needs to be specified by the ISA, and this is a contract. And this is one potential way of defining contract. All memory operations are in a global total order, as observed by every single processor. Uh, this is an abstract, and this, this is a good way of thinking about this, I think. Essentially, uh, if you think about it this way, then the memory is a switch that services one load or store at a time from any processor. And all processors see the currently serviced load or store at the same time. That way you will not run into the situation that we uh, saw earlier. All processors see the same order, if this is the case. right? You cannot have this parallel case where one processor uh, sees one order and the other processor sees some other order because they are accessing memory completely in parallel and memory is returning results in some, I don't know, whatever order based on the, the quickness of the memory. Right? Here, it's very strict. Memory is servicing only one request at a time and every processor has, sees it. And each processor's operations are serviced in program order that's assumed anyway from the one Neumann model. So you can see that this is a good thing to think about, but this is terrible for everything we've been talking about, right? If you really strictly implement it like this, this is abstraction, that's why it's an abstraction. But this is really sequentializing all the parallelism in the memory. You have all the banks, you can have different types of memory, different types of channels. What are you going to do with them? In the end, you reorder all of the operations such that they go through a single queue. That doesn't work that way. So this is not, that's not a good way of implementing sequential consistency, clearly. But the abstraction dictates this, meaning that uh, if the abstraction dictates it, you need to satisfy it somehow. So you need to do the ordering somehow. And there are many ways of implementing sequential consistency. I'm not going to talk about 
But most of the time, they add a lot of overhead in the end into the hardware because you need to really satisfy this ordering somehow. And it's very strict. It's all loads and all stores in the program. And if you have, okay, maybe four processors, you can do it. What if you go to tens of thousands of processors? Shared memory. So this is one of the scalability bottlenecks. If you keep your memory ordering model like this, then you will have to reorder all of those operations somehow such that everybody sees the same order. Okay. So uh, actually, as I said, it's not, uh, it's not a single order that's specific dictated. Right? There are actually multiple potentially correct global orders. The, the only requirement is every processor actually has the same order within its sequential program that's given. But every processor sees the same order. As long as that's satisfied, there are many correct global orders, right? And all are really sequentially consistent. Actually, in the example that I showed you, all of these are correct global orders. Because they satisfy the sequential execution in, in, each, in, in each processor. And as long as all of the processors see that order, that's good, right? OK, that's the idea. Uh, and which order? is really observed during execution depends on the implementation of the dynamic latencies, clearly. So, these are, this is also called an interleaving. It's really an interleaving of memory operations. I don't like the word interleaving because we've used the interleaving to interleave data across banks and channels, right? There's a lot of over... Although this is time-based interleaving of those operations, it's correct in the sense of the word, but it's overloaded. Uh, okay. So, so what are the corollaries of sequential consistency? Basically, uh, Within the same execution, all processors see the same global order of operations to memory. There's no correctness issue. That's good. We got rid of that. And it satisfies what happened before intuition, so the programmer uh, is happy, hopefully. And you will see Lamport's argument is that way also. But unfortunately, it doesn't solve this problem, as I already told you, or foreshadowed. Across different executions, now different global orders can be observed. Right. When you run the pro each of which is sequentially consistent. Meaning that debugging is still difficult across global orders because order changes across runs. So if you, if you go back over here, in one run you may get this order, in one, another run you may get this order. Right? So if you have a bug in your program, debugging will be hard because you're not exactly replicating what was happening. And you can actually get one, two, three, four, five, six orders here. That's a lot for a simple program like this. Now if you imagine larger critical sections, many costs are synchronizing. That's a lot of potential different orders. So you may, it may be very, very difficult to replicate a bug because your order changes across different, different rounds. Right? So the debugging problem is still there. But at least we don't have the correctness problem for programming this multiprocessor. Right? OK, if you have solutions to this problem, I'd be happy to talk about it. <laughs> it's not easy, I think. It's a very difficult problem over here. And people have tried. Uh, one of the solutions, for example, I'll give you an example. If you really care about debugging your program, you run it, you record the order. Somebody records the order. So the system records the order of operations. And when you're rerunning your program, for whatever reason, debugging it, you replay the order. Meaning you try to, you obey the same order that you had before. That's called record and replay based systems. Uh, uh, essentially, this way, hopefully, you get a consistent run. That's good, I guess. You can replicate your bugs. Uh, but it's a lot of overhead because there's a lot of recording that you need to do for the entire program. And replaying is also overhead, right? Because now your program is not executing as fast. But you could build a system, software-based system. Which, uh, of course, it becomes better with hardware support. But you could build a system that enables this. Of course, this is good for debugging, but uh, you still need to debug more because, OK, you may fix the bug in this interleaving, but if, what if there are bugs in some other interleavings, right? But it's not an easy problem, basically, in the end. And that's one potential solution. OK, so uh, any questions? This is beautiful, right? OK, so uh, clearly, I, I already mentioned that there are some issues with sequential consistency. It's a nice abstraction. And actually, there are some ISAs that specify that they're sequentially consistent. x86 is actually not sequentially consistent. x86 is based on total store, store ordering. And over time, things change as well. Uh, but it has two issues. Uh, but basically, it's too conservative. The ordering requirements are extremely conservative, right? Do so you really need all of those operations to have a single total global or global total order? As there, and also, uh, because of this, it limits the aggressiveness of performance enhancement techniques like out of order execution or caching or prefetching, even. Because prefetching is really 
providing data and to the processor earlier, right, how do you actually implement prefetching correctly uh, while preserving the order? Uh, so basically, the quick question is, is the total global order requirement too strong? And the answer is, I think, yes. Uh, basically, once you ask this question, the next question is, do we need a global order across all operations and all processors? And hopefully the answer is no. Uh, because you don't really need uh, all of these op uh, operations to be protected. What you really need is re to protect the synchronization. Right? When processors are not touching each other, each other's data, there should be no problem. But it, the problems happen when actually they're operating on shared data and they're synchronizing with each other. So one idea is really protecting only those parts. The other idea is maybe you should really care about only stores, right? This is called total store ordering. And this is, uh, it's called TSO, for example. X86 is a special version of it. But you can take a look at it. This is actually a good idea in general. It reduces the overhead. Uh, also, there are other store order memory models that people have developed. Uh, some of them are harder to understand than some others. You can take a look at that. Because a lot of these memory models also make exceptions for auto order execution. It becomes a mess in the end. I'm giving you the clean part. <laughs> There's a very dirty part also. Okay, uh, I like this one a lot actually. This is, this is a more weaker model. Basically, you don't even need to protect all stores. Again, if you're storing to a local variable that nobody else is ever going to read, who cares about the order of that store in a global way? The way right? You care about the order of that store from your program's perspective, but nobody else really cares about that because it's not going to update. Uh, uh, it's, it's, nobody else is going to touch it or it's not going to affect anyone. So, uh, they, uh, basically, maybe enforcing a global order only at the boundaries of synchronization is a good idea. Because that way you can actually ensure that everything else is unordered, at least from a global perspective, but only in the synchronization point you order things and everybody sees the same order so that you can get the synchronization right. And this is, uh, these are, these, uh, the other side idea has led to relaxed memory models that try to basically minimize the ordering requirements and minimize it such that you do uh, ordering only in the synchronization. And one example is the acquire release consistency model. Is we have operations called acquire and release. And acquire is basically you need to acquire or load a memory location for synchronization purposes and releases you release the memory location. And as long as you, you, you're consistent across these acquires and releases, then you can get a correct program. But then of course you need to there, there are some additional issues over here related to uh, labeling shared data, but you need to ensure that your shared data is labeled nicely over here. But I'm not going to go into detail. I'll, I'll provide uh, the Gar Chorley paper, for example, from ISCA 1990 is a really good example uh, talking about this sort of relaxed memory consistency model. Okay, uh, so let me go into a little bit more detail. Basically, performance enhancement techniques that could make uh, SC implementation difficult also exist, as we discussed. And these are mainly out of order execution and caching. I guess caching is a special form of prefetching also. But pre I would add prefetching also. But basically, out of order execution, uh, what is the problem here? Essentially, loads happen out of order with respect to each other and with respect to independent stores. And this makes it difficult for all processors to see the same global order of all memory operations, essentially. Because you have. Uh, uh, this, this sort of auto ordering. Caching, maybe it's, it's even more intuitive to understand, but you have a memory location that's now present in multiple places, and a cache prevents the effect of a store to be seen by other processors, for example. We will see this when we talk about coherence, which is a completely different issue than consistency. But for example, if you're not exposing some operations to memory because it's in your cache, now, by definition, other processors are not seeing those operations, but you're seeing those operations, right? So by nature, I mean intuitively, you don't even have those operations in the ordering of the other processors. And you may have a problem with that, thing, clearly. Okay, so that's why uh, uh, you really need to expose those operations. And, and, and this is actually the place where you really want to uh, keep st stuff in your cache. You have a shared synchronization variable, and you want to keep it in the cache. But whenever you're actually updating it or reading it, you will need to expose it to others. Okay, so weaker memory consistency, uh, basically the observation is that the ordering of operations is important when the order affects operations on shared data. I've already said this, uh, but let's go into just a little bit more detail. Uh, in other words, when processors need to synchronize to execute a program region, I call this a program region because uh, different processors may be executing different program regions, but the critical section is one example of this, right? That's where you really need to uh, ensure the ordering of operations. 
So weak consistency is, the idea is programmer specifies the regions in which memory operations do not need to be enforced. So you can actually, uh, if you correctly label your programs such that these regions are completely nicely specified and only those regions where you really need to do get the ordering correct, then you get rid of a lot of the ordering burden of the sequential consistency. But of course now, what did we do? We punted on the program a little bit, right? Of course the compiler can potentially do it as well, but discovery of uh, these synchronization locations is not easy, completely uh, independently of the program. As I mentioned earlier, if the program actually programmed nicely, they went through libraries for every single synchronization operation, you, by nature they're labeled. But if they didn't do that, they played some tricks and they synchronized, they updated some shared memory location with an atomic operation, they just stored something and tested it with some other thread, then you need to find that out. Right? It may not be that easy to find out actually. Okay. Okay, uh, so basically, uh, this is why uh, memory trans instructions exist in ISAs also. Uh, essentially, uh, you have memory trans instructions de uh, that delineate those regions. Uh, all mem uh, what, what are these? These are basically ordering operations, special ordering instructions that basically say all memory operations before the fence must complete before the fence is executed, and no memory operation after the fence is started. Basically, all memory operations after the fence must wait for the fence to complete. So it basically puts a hammer and says, everything that you've done so far, please complete it and get done with it. And now start the next operation. And if you want to actually put it complete to the programmer, programmer can actually keep adding pencils. Right? If they want this particular uh, uh, memory access to be visible to everyone in the order, they could keep serializing everything. They could add a memory pencil after every load or store. Right? But you really want to get this correct when you actually acquire a lock, for example, when you have the synchronization uh, that you're doing. Okay. And hence is complete in program order, clearly. Uh, and essentially all synchronization operations act like a fence. And that way you can actually have a weak consistent model. There's a little bit more detail in this, of course, especially if you add caching and out-of-order execution, but I'm not going to talk about that. That's beyond the course. We could have a few lectures on memory consistency, but by the end of it, you will say, I'm done with this stuff. <laughs> it's important, but maybe it's not that important, let's say. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there are clearly trade-offs uh, related to uh, consistency, uh, weaker consistency. So weaker consistency has the advantage that now you don't need to guarantee a very strict order of memory operations. Uh, as a result, the hardware implementation can be simpler, and you can keep adding these performance enhancement techniques without worrying about the ordering requirements as much. And uh, it also can be higher performance and stricter ordering. Uh, actually, the paper, the ISCA 1990 paper by Kuros Garatoli shows that also. Of course, this has disadvantages. Now, there's more burden on the programmer, right? Now, it's not just the hardware that does everything. In sequential consistency, the programmer doesn't need to do anything, right? They don't need to label shared data, they don't need to label locks, they don't need to do anything basically. As long as they implement the synchronization permanence correctly, which they should do anyway, if they want a multi-thread program, everything is good. Here you go, you, add, you go and label where you need to actually acquire, release, and a little bit more if you want to do more optimization. So basically, somebody needs to get the fences correct. And again, as I said, it's another example of the programmer microarchitect trade-off. Okay, any questions? Is this fascinating? Okay, so we may end up early today then because I don't think I, we're going to cover cache coherence in the last five minutes. But I think before uh, I end up, uh, there is a nice question uh, in one of the past midterms or whatever, finals, I guess it says final, uh, that looks into uh, sequential consistency. Actually, earlier, well, you'll, have, you'll have one question in your homework also. But basically, it's, it's good to go through this. I'm not going to go through this basically, but this shows that uh, you have two threads that are concurrently running a dual core cluster that implements a sequential consistent memory model. Assume some things, list all possible values that can be stored in R3 after both threads have finished executing. Right? So this is a good exercise, for example, for you to understand how sequential consistency works. Clearly, there, there will be multiple possible values because there will be multiple possible orderings over here. 
But you can eliminate a lot of those orderings because they lead to the same result in the end. And you should eliminate all of the incorrect orderings from the sequential consistency perspective, clearly. Uh, and then the set I like this also, basically, uh, this kind of reverse engineering. After both threads have finished executing, you find that this is what the register contents are. Uh, how many different instruction interleavings of the two threads produce this result? That's not fun, right? It's actually not a hard question. It's easy. You can find the solution also over there. And what is the total number of possible instruction interleavings? Uh, and I guess it's also nice. I like this. On a non sequentially consistent processor, it's the total number of possible instruction interleavings less than or equal to or greater than your answer to question C. What do you think? Anyway, you'll need to do the thing, but intuitively it should be greater than right. <laughs> because you, you, you have no restrictions on the order on a non-sequentially consistent processor. Okay, so that's the end. Last chance for questions. Okay, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. We'll have fun with cash coin.